Good afternoon. Welcome to lecture 10. Today, we will talk about short-term fluctuations in the economy. Last time, we talked about the long-term trend in the economy, and we used the solo model in order to show where the economy heads in the long term. Today, we are going to examine what happens in the short term. So let me catch you up with what we talked previously in economics and society. So we started by defining what money is. We talked about the functions, the roles, and the properties of money. We talked about the intrinsic value and fiat money, two different kinds of money, one that has the value in itself and the other one that just represents trust from the government. Then we talked about the banking system, that we have a central bank that uh, governs the, the whole money market. And then we have the commercial banks, that they're just the intermediators between investment and saving. Then we talked about the money supply, the money demand. We said that the money demand is split into three different money demands. The first one is the money demand for speculation. The second is the money demand for precaution. And the third one is the money demand for transactions. Then we talked about the equilibrium interest rate and the monetary policy. And finally, we finished with talking about inflation. What are the, the good and the bad things about inflation? So today, we're going to talk about the participants of the commodity market. Then we will examine what happens in the equilibrium of this market. We will talk about fiscal policy, links between markets, monetary policy, and then we will finish with a discussion on unemployment. Today's lecture will be a little difficult in parts, especially when we talk about the link between markets and the monetary policy. It will be a little bit more technical, but there is a lot of intuition that can be taken out of today's lecture, and it's very important. So, let's get started. Participants of the commodity market. The commodity market examines the expenditure side of the economy. The commodity market is a market where real GDP is traded. So, in other words, is produced, consumed, invested, saved, etc. So let's see here very briefly an outline of what is going on in this market. The following actors take part in the commodity market. The first is the households. The households have income Y, they pay taxes T, they consume C, and they're saving, uh, they're saving S. So we have seen from previously all these uh, variables except, I think, taxation, taxation will be incorporated in our model from today. So we have the, the real income, which is actually the output that is produced. Why? Then some of this income will be paid to the government for uh, public good uses and everything else that the government does. So this will be denoted by T. Then uh, after that, households consume income or they save income for later consumption. The second actor is the firms. Uh, the firms invest. Don't forget that investment comes from saving most of the time. And then they produce output. So you can see here that, that this output that the firms produce, it actually circulates back to the, to the firms. Third participant is the government. The government collects taxes taxation, and they spend money uh, through uh, government spending. The fourth participant is the foreign sector. Today, we'll not, uh, we will not uh, bother very much with the foreign sector. However, in general, the foreign sector consumes output that we produce and produces some output that we consume through import. So the foreign sector appears in our model from the use of X and M, as we have seen in the income identity, the expenditure identity from two, already two lectures before. Now, trade in this market does not necessarily involve money. So we have seen that all these market actors, they do not really need any intermediating money, fiat money, or intrinsic value, value money in order to transact. 
So directly, they can use output in order to do everything here. So let's simplify and let's uh, go back to our assumption and think that there is only one good in the economy. This economy doesn't have money, doesn't have anything. So let's assume that we have only one good, let's say corn. So this uh, economy produces only corn. So if you produce only corn, so Y will be the total production of corn. And T will be the amount of corn that the government collects in order to do its own business. And C is the amount of corn that you consume, that you actually eat. And then saving is the amount of corn that you put aside in order to consume at some point later. Now, the firms, on the other hand, they produce this corn, that's why. But here's a good question. In an economy that has only corn, what is the investment? How can corn be used for investment? If you know the answer, write it in the comments down below. So, the government collects some corn through taxation and spends it in, in its own use, in what the government wants to, to do. And then we have the foreign sector, which we send them some of our corn, and they send us some of their corn. So this is pretty much an economy that can function very well without ever assuming that money is involved. So it can work without money. So we are talking about the market that the commodity, the production, the output is actually traded. We do not involve money in this market. Everything is in real terms. If we choose to measure Y, T, C, S, I, G, X, and M, if we want to measure them in money, that's okay, but only the measurement will be in money. No money is actually going back and forth in this particular model. Now, let's take all of these participants and examine their behavior very, very particularly for each one of them separately. First of all, households divide after-tax income Y minus T. So Y minus T is the income that you have after the government has taxed you, your net income, in other words. So households divide the after-tax income, Y minus T, into two different destinations. The first destination is consumption, and the second destination is save. In other words, the households either consume or save their income for later. Again, by the word income here, I mean real income, that is total production. Okay, we do not, we're not talking about money, we're talking about production, the value of production. So, this means that the after-tax income, Y minus T, will be equal to C plus S. This is an identity, holds all the time. It means that what I consume plus what I save, this will add to my after-tax income. We describe the behavior of households with respect to consumption by using the consumption function. This is a function that shows me how households consume. This means that consumption would be equal to a constant A plus a fraction B times the disposable income, the after-tax income for the household. Now, the positive constant A is a basic minimum level of consumption. It's a consumption that the household has to do in order to survive. So even if your after-tax income is zero, you still need to consume A in order to survive. Nobody can survive uh, with consuming nothing. The fraction B is the marginal propensity of consumption. We denote that by MPC. It's the portion of after-tax income that will be consumed the rest of the income will be saved. The rest of the disposable income that will not be consumed will actually be saved. For example, C equals 200 plus 0 0.6 times my after-tax income. So the consumption function will show me the total consumption for every level of after-tax income you give me. So give me what is Y minus T, 
I will plug it into this equation and I will actually be able to tell you exactly how much I will consume. And from this, you can figure out how much also I save, which in this case today, it's not going to be our major concern, but still you can actually use this math to calculate it. Now, the consumption function in particular in our simplified model will be C equals A plus B times the disposable income, as we said, and this will be affected only, as you can see, from the disposable income. So there's no other factor that matters within this particular consumption function, only the disposable income affects it. In reality, however, our consumption is affected by various factors. Several factors do affect our consumption. The real interest rate, for example, will affect consumption inversely because a higher interest rate makes saving more attractive. So if I decide, for example, to save 40% of my income and consume the other 60% of my income, and then the interest rate goes way up, I may want to reconsider my decision. And since the interest rate is higher, now I can trade more consumption tomorrow for every unit of consumption that I give up today. So in this case, saving becomes more attractive for me and it's very likely that I will reconsider my decision and instead of saving only 40%, now I may start saving more 50%, 60%, depending on how high the interest rate is. Household wealth will affect C positively because high wealth makes saving less attractive. If you are very wealthy, then maybe you need to save less because you already have a lot of savings in the bank and you, are, uh, you feel secure for your future no matter what. The same happens if you have expectation only for future income. This will affect your consumption because your expectation will influence the distribution between consumption and saving. Uh, and a, a very good example that we have said before is the saving rate or the consumption rate by college students. College students, they tend to consume a lot of their income and this is because they expect in the future that they will have a higher income. So a dollar today for them has bigger value than a dollar tomorrow. All right, so these are three factors. You can find also other factors that they affect income and consumption. Uh, if you find any other factor, just uh, write it down in the comments and I will answer to you if it's correct or, or if there is something else that you should be thinking about it regarding this particular factor. Notice that the consumption function, of course, indirectly implies that there is a saving function and this is because from the identity that I gave you in the previous slide, S will be equal to the disposable income minus the consumption. So whatever I do not consume, I actually save it. So you can apply this equation here and you can derive a saving function very, very easily with some very simple algebra. Now, the firms. In the commodity market model, the role of the firms is simply to conduct investment in physical capital. So the role of the firm is to take some part of the output, invest it, so they will be able to produce output for the next period. Okay, that's the, pretty much the entire thing that uh, firms are concerned with. So investment refers to the purchases by firms of equipment, new buildings, addition to inventories, as we, we multiple times uh, said so far. Here we will assume that investment does not depend on the level of income. So it doesn't matter what is your why for investment. In other words, I'm very uh, indirectly trying to tell you here that investment will be a standalone variable. It will not be affected by any other variable in our model. So we are not going to have a function for investment. We will have only just a number that will be given to you. In other words, Therefore, there is no investment function that relates I to Y, as we had with the consumption in this case, that we related Y minus T to the level of consumption. But however, investment will be related to the interest rate, and this is very, very important. So let's try 
to examine what happens here. Let's consider an example. Assume that there are 14 investment projects for $100 each. So each project of these 14 projects will worth $100. In other words, you have to invest $100 to them. And each one of them is expected to yield the following per year returns. So we'll give you your $100 back, of course, plus the first one will give you 9%, the second also 9 the third 7 then 5 5 5 4 4 3%, and then 2 and 2 and 1 and 1 and 1%. Now, if you have $1,400 in your pocket, you can do all 14 investments. There is no problem whatsoever for that. But if the interest rate was 4.5%, how much would you invest of your money on those particular projects? So this is an interesting question here because I have my $1,400. I have these investments, but I also have the prospect of putting my money into a bank account and I will get 4.5%, okay? so that I have an opportunity cost for taking each of these investments. Now, if the interest rate is 4.5%, I would do the first investment, the first project, 9%, and the second project, 9%, because they both give me more than my opportunity cost, which is 4.5%. And then the same for the third, for the fourth, for the fifth, and for the sixth. The seventh investment project here gives me 4%. I don't want to do that because I can actually better place my money in the bank and I will get 4.5 instead of four. So therefore, these are the investment projects that I will undertake and these ones are the ones that they will not undertake. Meaning that my total investment will be six projects times 100 each, I will have $600 of total investment and the other money, I will leave them to sit in the bank because it's better there for me than to put them into these investment projects. What will happen in this decision if I had the same amount of money, but now the interest rate is 3.5%. This means that in addition to my first six projects, now the other two projects that they will yield 4% each one of them here, those become attractive also because now my opportunity cost goes down to 3.5. This means that I want to undertake these projects and I will not undertake these ones, I will reject them. So I will have a total of eight projects times 800 each equal to $800 of total investment in this particular case. If the interest rate was falling to 2.5%, then I will also do the ninth project here, which gives me 3% and it's now higher than the interest rate, and I will reject the other one. So my investment will actually increase nine times $100 each. This will give me $900 of investment. So what I observe here is that investment is inversely related to the real interest rate. Again, investment is inversely related to the real interest rate, meaning that when for some reason, maybe from something that happens in the money market, the real interest rate, the equilibrium real interest rate increases, I should expect that my investment in the commodity market will be going down and vice versa. If something happens and my interest rate goes down, I should expect that in my commodity market, investment will go up. This is a very important result. We are going to name this as L2. Remember that in the previous lecture, we had another result that we named L1. Go back to your notes and check which result is that, because today we are going to make heavy use of both of these results. And if you don't know and you do not understand very well both of these results, then you better 
press stop and go back, understand them, and then keep watching this part of the lecture because if you don't understand L1 and L2, it will be a waste of time to continue. Okay, make sure that you really understand them well. So, let's examine now the government. We talked about the households, we talked about the firms. The third participant is the government. Let's see what happens with the government. The government has two important functions. The first function is that it spends a fixed amount of income. We name this G. So G is the government spending. And it spends it into useful or useless pro projects. This is not to make a complaint that, you know, government spends the money in useless projects. Uh, some governments do that. Uh, an increasing number of governments do that. Some governments, they don't. But in general, what is worth noticing here is that for our model, we are considering the short-term fluctuations in the economy. This means that we are not concerned with what is going to happen 5, 10, 20 periods into the future. We are concerned what is going to happen in the next period. Meaning that even if the government does a very, uh, a very useful project, undertakes a very useful project that will be some investment for far, far ahead in the future, uh, this will not be captured in this model. So it doesn't matter if the model, uh, in this model, if the government spends its money into useful or useless projects. G does not depend on Y or T or anything else. So again, it's going to be a standalone number. And then the second part of, the, of what government does is that it uh, collects a portion of the income. That's how they fund the spending. They collect some income through taxation. A usual function for taxation is that taxation is proportional to the income. So for example, in Singapore, the average taxation coefficient would be something like 6 to 7%. So this means that if you make 100,000 a year, government will take 6% or 7% of that. So this is a very simple function here that T, which is the total amount of taxes that the government collects. So T is the, re the total revenue of the government from, from taxation would be equal to the taxation coefficient, which is the lowercase t. The taxation coefficient is just a fraction. Okay, it will be like 6% or 7% or 30%, like for example, it is in the United States, or 40%, like for example, it is in Greece, or 13%, as for example, is in Russia. Every country has a very different approach in uh, uh, the taxation coefficient. So this will be the taxation coefficient times your income. Okay, this is what we, you will pay as tax. So for example, if my income is 100,000 and taxation is 10%, so lowercase t will be 10%, 10 this will be 100,000, and then the 10% of 100,000 is 10,000, this thing here will be 10,000. So make sure that you distinguish what is capital, case T and what is lower case T because you don't want to confuse this in the future. Now, the government does not invest and does not produce. But here you will be like, what are you talking about? The government produces a lot of things. Okay, the, the, there is government production, almost like, for example, the government has the police which produces order. Okay, the government has the courts that they produce arbitration between different cases. The government has a lot of production and offers a lot of infra infrastructure. Yes, it does. But the government just owns entities, which in our model will be considered firms, and the firms will carry out the investment and the production. So in reality, too, any production done by the government is considered to be carried on by government-owned firms. Okay, meaning that government only governs, meaning that spends G and collects T. And if they run some kind of production, then this is run by firms, the owner of which is the government, or in some cases, partially the government. All right, so this is what the government does. 
Now, the foreign sector, here there will be a simplification because you don't want to have a very complicated model here. We will simplify the foreign sector by assuming that imports are equal to exports. Okay, whatever we produce here and we send abroad, the same thing they produce abroad, the same quantity, the same value they produce abroad and they send to us. So we have no trade deficit or trade surplus here. X minus M will be zero. All right, net exports in this economy will always be zero. In this economy, the foreign sector does not affect the equilibrium output because domestic GDP consumed abroad will be equal to the foreign GDP consumed domestically. So this will actually drop out from the calculation of equilibrium that is coming up. Let's now see what happens with the equilibrium in this market. So the equilibrium in the commodity market will be governed by the equilibrium condition. The commodity market will be in equilibrium when Y is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M, but because we have already assumed that X minus M will be zero, this X minus M will actually drop out from this equilibrium condition here. So my equilibrium condition will be simply Y equal to C plus I plus G. That is, the supply of output produced, which is Y, will be equal to the demand of income for consumption by the households, the demand of income for investment by the firms, the demand of income for spending by the government, G. Let's look at it one more time carefully. The left-hand side of this equation is the supply side. The right-hand side of this equation is the demand side. So supply is the total output that firms in this economy produce. Demand is the three different active actors here because the foreign sector is kind of thrown out of the model like discreetly here. So we have three different demanders of, of output. The first one is the household, the second is the firms, and the third is the government. So, the households demand some output to consume, the firms demand some output to invest, and the government demands some output to spend. So we have supply from the firms of output, and then we have demand from the households for consumption, demand from the firms for investment, and demand from the government for spending. All right, so this is the left-hand side is the source, the right-hand side is the destination of the income. This is, don't forget that we have seen this function again, the equilibrium condition, we have seen it as a function again, as the calculation of GDP from the expenditure side, and the same function here will be used as the equilibrium condition. Now, notice that saving S is not a part of the demand. It's not, as some people say, demand for income to be saved. Okay, you don't demand income to be saved because simply if you do that, if you inc include the income that you save in this equation, you will double count some part of the income. What is this part of the income that you double count? We said in the previous lecture, and this is very, very important to remember, that the amount of investment in the economy is coming from the amount of saving through the commercial banks. I go there and I deposit my money, somebody takes it as a loan and they invest something. Okay, so, if I include S there, the same output that will be in S, the same output will be also in I. So I will double count the output. And the same is true for taxation. T is not a demand for income to be taxed because in the same manner like before, 
government spending comes from taxation. So if you include taxation and also spending from the government, you will include the same dollar twice, the same amount of output twice. So this is not what you want to do here. So this uh, taxation will always be already be counted as demand for government spending. And therefore, we do not include S, we do not include T. The equilibrium condition will be Y equals C plus I plus G and nothing else. Another important note that I want to make is that this equation here is just a condition. This means that it doesn't have to necessarily hold true. If it holds true, the economy will be in an equilibrium situation. If it doesn't hold true, the economy will be in a disequilibrium situation. So the only thing that this condition tells us is that check your economy. If this is true, then in this case, your economy will be in an equilibrium situation. If it's not true, it will be in a disequilibrium situation. All right, so this is to clear everything with respect to the equilibrium condition. Let's continue with an example. I want to take all of these that we said and I put them down in one simple example. So what I want you to do right now is take pen and paper, get ready, because we are going to involve here some arithmetics of the calculation of the income. And we will present the whole calculation of what Y is going to be for a particular example. Now, a disclaimer. These three slides that they are coming, they are pretty technical. However, they are extremely easy. They look scary, but in reality, they are very, very easy. This means that if you do it with the mathematics, it will be easier for you than doing it with the graphs and the curves that I will show you afterwards. And you will be like, yeah, right. The math is never easier than the curves, than the graphs, but this is not the case here because I have taught this class before and several students that I asked, all of them 100%, even the students that they had no idea about math, they said, no, the math is easier to approach this than graphs, okay? Not because the graph is too difficult, but because the math here is just straightforward. There is no other way of doing it than the one that I will show you. The model itself will tell you what to do once you know a couple of very easy things. So, paper, pen, and let's get started. Consider an economy where X equals M. This is to show you that my initial assumption from the beginning that the foreign sector will not be very involved here still holds true. So X is equal to M. This means that X minus M is going to be zero. So it's not going to affect my model here. Then I will give you the four key variables for the model. Consumption is equal to 100 plus 0.75, the disposable income. Investment will be 120. Government spending will be 220. And taxation will be 0.2 times Y. That is the 20% of the income. We always start solving this model. Always, but always. There's no reason to try to do it in any different way is by starting from the equilibrium condition. You want to find the equilibrium in this particular model, so there is no other logical place to start other than starting from the equilibrium condition. So let's take this equilibrium condition and let's substitute C, I, and G. In other words, I want to find the equilibrium. I, of course, start from the equilibrium condition. Once I have the equilibrium condition, the equilibrium condition by itself will tell me I need C, I need I, and I need G. If you don't give me C, I, and G, there's nothing that you can do with this equation other than that. All right, so let's take this and uh, information that we have already and plug it inside this equilibrium condition. My Y will be equal to C. C is equal to 100 plus 0.75, the disposable income. 
and then i, which is 120, and then g, which is 220. Now I have a lot of stuff to work here. First of all, let me take the numbers and add them together. 100 plus 120 plus 220 will be 440. And then let me break open this parenthesis here. 0 0.75 times y minus 0 0.75 times t. All right, so now I want to calculate y. So y from the beginning is what I'm going after. I want to calculate y. Here's my y. Here's another y, but here I have this t. So by itself, the model now tells me, give me t. You have t. Just put plug t in there. All right, so you plug t, and if you substitute t, it will be y equals 440 plus 0 0.75 times y minus 0 0.75 times 0.2y. Let me do 0 0.75 times 0 0.2. This will give me 0 0.15. So my y will be equal to 440 plus 0.75y minus 0.15y. And then if I take these two y's in the end and I subtract them from each other, I will get 0.6y. So now I have a simple equation here with only one unknown, and I can very easily solve that. If I solve for y, my y minus 0.6y will be equal to 440. This means that 0.4y on the left-hand side will be equal to 440, or in other words, y will be equal to 440 divided by 0.4. And finally, my y will be equal to 1,100. I will put this in a box for two reasons. The first reason that I want it to be in a box is because I want to be able to have everything organized. And later, when I will be using this exam in the second part of the question, I will know immediately where it is because this is an important number. This is my equilibrium Y there. I will need that later. So I put it in the box. This is the first reason, and this is the minor reason. The second reason is the most important one, which is if my examiner asked me to calculate that, I should put it in a box, so make it easier for my examiner to see where my answer is. Because I always want to make the life of my examiner easier, because a happier examiner gives better grades, and this is a fact. So try to make the life of your graders easier. This will work for you so, so much. Okay, never neglect doing that writing in a clean handwriting and putting your final results into boxes so you will make the life of the person who looks in your paper easier and give this person a reason to give you a better grade, okay? So, this is the uh, how we solve it. There is no way that you can get lost while you're solving that. The model itself puts you in a path and tells you what you have to do. There is no way that you can actually do something wrong here. This is so easy that if I put it in the exam, I will put it there just to give you some free points. All right, so it's, it's as easy that every time that this has been examined, students have a, a success of rate like above 85% meaning that only the 15% of the students, which are actually tourists, they are not able to know what to do here. And this is because they don't know from where to begin. No, they don't know how to solve the model. All right, so enough with this. Now, I want to uh, do a very useful exercise here. And let's keep this model. But now I want to increase the government spending. I want to see how my income, my Y, will be affected if government increases the government spending. So I will take G and I will make it 265. So instead of 220, I will increase it and I will make it 265. So I'm increasing G for 45 units. 
And I want to show you that now this should increase Y also for 45 units. And this is something reasonable to expect. We're just expecting it. We're not sure that it's going to happen. Okay, but we have this feeling, this expectation, because we say, okay, listen, G is on the other side of the equation. If G increases 45 units and everything else is constant, I should expect that Y will increase by 45 units. So this is my initial expectation as an economist. Let's see if it will materialize. So again, I have to solve for Y. So let me start with the equilibrium condition. I always start from my equilibrium condition. I will replace C, I, and G there. This is my C, same like before, same I, but now my G will be 265 instead of what I had before. Again, I do my calculation. So Y is equal to 485 plus 0.75 Y minus 0.75 T, which reminds me that I have to substitute T there. T is 0.2 times Y. So I plug it in there. I do the calculations like I did before. And then I have one equation. Y is equal to 485 plus 0.6 Y, which... It's very easy to solve for y. I'm transferring 0.6 on the left-hand side and I subtract it from 1y. This is going to give me that 0.4y is equal to 485. So y is going to be equal to 485 over 0.4. And therefore, my y will be equal to 1,213. However, when I look at this now, it comes to me that before, my Y was 1,100. Actually, there you go. There it is. Y is equal 1,000 to 100 when G is to 20. And now G increased for 45 units. And my Y is 1,213. This means that I increased my G for 45 units, but my Y didn't only increase for 45 units as I expected, but actually increased for 113 units. What gives? I increased the one side of my equilibrium condition for 45 units, and the other one increased by 113. How is that possible? How they will balance now? What happened and these two, they were not equal. Let's try and apply a different example and see if we will come closer to give an explanation to that. So let me keep G to what it was before, to 20. All right, and now I will change T. And I will make the government to decrease taxes. So it will be 15% of the income now instead of 20% that it was before. So again, I start from the equilibrium condition. Again, we substitute C, I, and G there. Here is C, here is I, and here is G. All right. And then I do my calculations here exactly as I did them in slide 14. And then I substitute the new taxation here, which is 0.15 now. I do my calculations and I have one equation now, again with one unknown. And we solve for Y and we will come up to the result that Y is almost equal to 1,214. That's very, very close to the income I had before in slide 15 when I increased G instead of, uh, of T. But I see here that decreasing taxation by 5% and increasing government spending by 45 units actually gives me pretty much the same result, roughly the same result, with respect to how 
production in this economy response. Still, I haven't answered my question. So let me turn to the graphs because it seems that math is not able to give me an answer here. I have to look into the intuition to find some context and to find why I have this discrepancy that I increase my government spending a little and I see a big increase in the production in the economy in income on the other side. All right, so graphical representation. This is my commodity market. I will use here this graph to represent what is going on in the market. I will put in the horizontal axis my income, Y, my production. Okay, this is in the horizontal axis. And in the vertical axis, I will put C plus I plus G, which is my total expenditure. So in other words, this graph splits. My supply of income will be here in the horizontal axis, and my demand of income, as we said before, it will be my demand for expenditure, actually, will be on the, on the vertical axis. So first of all, I have to understand when I will see the equilibrium in this kind of peculiar graph. So where is my equilibrium? My equilibrium will be when what I have in the horizontal axis will be equal to what I have on the vertical axis. This means that I'm actually applying my equilibrium condition. My equilibrium condition says that Y is equal to C plus I plus G. So when whatever is in this axis is equal to whatever is this in this axis, there will be where my equilibrium is. There is a very simple mathematical device, geometrical device, that will show me this equilibrium condition. It's just the 45 degree line. If I have the 45 degree line and I pick a point here, for example, then by going vertically up until I meet my 45 degree line and then horizontally to the left until I meet the axis, this will be equal here than it will be there. This is the use of my 45 degree line to just show me where the equilibrium condition is true. So along this line, along this dotted gray line, Y is equal to C plus I plus G because Y is in the horizontal axis and C plus I plus G is on the vertical axis. Now, the 45 degree line will show me where the equilibrium condition materializes. C is increasing in Y. Okay, it's increasing in Y minus T. Therefore, it will be increasing in Y as well. It will be something like that. So this is my C. And then I and G, they are just numbers. They don't vary with Y. So they will look something like that in this particular graph. So I have C, I, and G, and now I have to add them together to get C plus I plus G. Now the C plus I plus G will be a curve that will have the same slope with C. Because obviously from this graph, C has some slope, but I and G have both of them zero slope. So if you have the slope of C and then you add a zero slope and you add another zero slope, the slope of C plus I plus G will be equal to the slope of C. So the C plus I plus G curve will be parallel to C, but it will be higher up by whatever I is plus whatever G is. So here is my I. I will take it and I will put it above the C curve. And then I will take G and I will put it on top of I. Right there. Here I have my C. And therefore, from wherever C, I, and G is, my C plus I plus G curve will start and will be parallel to the C curve. So this is my C plus I plus G curve. Now we said that 
at the 45 degree line is when the equilibrium condition actually materializes. Therefore, my equilibrium here will be when the C plus I plus G, which is given by the purple line, is equal to the 45 degree line. And therefore, I can find my equilibrium at A, which is equal to Y star. So this is how graphically we can understand where the equilibrium is. Now, let's try to see what happens if we increase G in this graph. In other words, let's do exactly the same with what we did before mathematically. Now we are going to do it graphically. So I will take my C plus I plus G curve and I will add there the increase in G. This will make my curve to shift upwards because now I'm just adding a higher number to this curve. So my curve will increase parallelly shift up from the previous curve. I have the curve to move into a new place C plus I plus G1 because I assume that my spending increased from G to G1. And as we can very clearly see here, we have the equilibrium to move to point B where I have Y1, which is higher. Now, I want you to observe here what is the difference in G and what is the difference in Y? So these two here, as you can see, they do not have to be equal because the slopes are how they are. It means that an increase in G, a parallel shift of the curve, will actually be mapped to a bigger increase down here. So obviously, delta G is smaller than delta Y down there. So this means that mathematically before I was not wrong, but what is the intuition? What is the reason why this happens? And there is a simple reason that we neglected before and now it will come into place and you will see that everything will actually make sense. Let's see it. Government spending stimulates the demand side of the economy. For example, imagine that the excess spending is used by the government to buy garbage trucks. So we buy some, some garbage trucks and we're gonna buy these garbage trucks from some company who produces garbage trucks. So we are going to pay this company and get the, get the garbage trucks. This means that this company, the owners, the, the people that they work there will have more money and they will also want to spend this money that the government now spend it on them. So they have it now and they want to spend it. So they will in turn increase also the demand of the economy. They will spend this money to something else. Let's say they will go to John's restaurant and they will have dinner and then John will have the money and will spend it to something like he will go to the bookstore and buy a book for his son. And the, the bookstore who got this money will actually create some other demand and this demand will keep uh, going around in the economy. So that is why an increase in G for 45 units led to a bigger increase in Y because we had this stimulation effect to happen here and uh, affect income at a multiple of what delta G is. So income will be generated for a company that produces the garbage trucks, and then the owners of the company will spend this income on something else, and this cycle will continue till the demand will be higher enough to show us what is the final increase in I star down there. All right, let's see how the same thing works now with the taxation decrease. Taxation decrease is not difficult to, to understand either. It's a little bit different than the increase in government spending. Uh, let's go back to the consumption function for a little bit. Here we have C is equal to A plus B times Y minus T. And I want to see what is actually the slope here of this function, of the consumption function. The slope of the consumption function is B, but is B with respect to y minus t. It is not b with respect to y. And the reason that this is the case is because some y 
is also hidden within T. Look at that. If I write it like that, my taxation, I write it lowercase t times y, then I will multiply here. I will take the common factor of the two parentheses. So my slope of the consumption function with respect to y will be equal to b times 1 minus t. So in other words, the slope of this purple function that you see on the graph is coming from the slope of c, which is actually b times 1 minus t. So taxation affects this slope as well. So a decrease in t will increase the slope of c plus i plus g. That is, it will turn the curve, it will rotate the curve counterclockwise because the curve will be like that and will have a higher slope now. It will turn counterclockwise. It will, it will increase in slope. It will be something like that, as you can see here. So we have this new curve and therefore, again, the equilibrium will shift up and we see here that we have y to go now to y star 2 and this leads to a higher equilibrium output. So households, in other words, have more disposable income to spend, meaning that if you decrease taxation, now households have more income to spend, they will start spending it. So now you have, instead of G, you have C to be stimulating the side of the demand, and this will cause a stimulation in the final level of Y star and will increase it to Y star 2. All right, let's see now how fiscal policy works. The government can stimulate the economy and it can increase the total production in two different ways. The first way is to spend, spend money, spend G. If you spend G, you create demand for output, which is greater than the increase in G. So it seems like a good deal that you keep increasing G and then this heats up the economy to produce more. The second way is by decreasing taxes. If you decrease the taxation coefficient T, you stimulate the demand for output through household spending. So in other words, you stimulate consumption of the household because households pay now less taxes, so they will be able to use more of their income to consume instead of paying it to the government. All right, so these are the two different ways of increasing Y through uh, government intervention. The first is the government will spend a little more, and the second is that the government will tax people a little less. These practices are known as what we call expansionary fiscal policy. So this is expansionary fiscal policy in the sense that it's how the government can actually intervene in the economy and change the course of the equilibrium in the commodity market by either spending more money or by taxing a little less the households. In some cases, the government may want to apply the opposite, may want to make the economy to contract. All right, this is by decreasing G or by increasing T. Such policy can help to ease inflation or to lower government debt. So in other words, you don't spend too much in order to pay your debt or you increase taxation coefficient in order to have money to pay back some debts that you have from previous years. So this is a policy that will be used in order that has a result that the government increases the amount of money that it has by spending less or by increasing its revenues from taxes in order to create a, a fall in prices or to lower the debt or actually both of these uh, together at the same time. So expansionary fiscal policy is good because it can stimulate the economy when it's in need of stimulation. For example, uh, in the period of the coronavirus, 
in 2020, we see that the government spends a lot of money, already announced a lot of stimulation packages in order to support the economy. That is, they see that the economy is going down and they try to apply some fiscal policy in order to make it to uh, uh, stay at least constant or to ease the fall. And the other one, uh, the opposite uh, uh, thing that the government will do in, in cases that the economic activity is already too stimulated, then in these cases you will see the government that they want to ease a little bit the increase of prices in order to avoid the negative effects of inflation that we covered in Lecture 9. And in this case, they can also collect some more money to pay off their debts. So this is with respect to the fiscal policy of the government. Now, if I had stopped this discussion here, I would have slipped under the carpet one of the most important implications in this entire course of economics and society. And here is what you actually haven't observed so far. These two alternatives that the government has, either to expand the government spending or to decrease the tax coefficient, might seem as two alternative ways of doing exactly the same thing. Somebody can say, let's increase G, sounds more fun. Somebody else can say, let's decrease T, let's give the people the, the ability to be able to spend more. Some other can say, let's do both, a little increase in G, offer better schools, offer better universities, better health services, better stimulus packages for the firms that they needed, and also decrease a little bit T, so common people, they will also have more money in their hands to spend. So it sounds like these two things are, are totally alternative to each other. However, this is actually the backbone of the political system and the political controversy as we live it in the 20 and 21st century. Okay, so let's see what happens here. Probably you have heard mainly from other countries that politics are divided into two different opinions, the left and the right. As you probably know, the left advocates for more liberties in general, and then the right is a more conservative political view, but this is not the only difference. The main difference right now that you will hear from left-wing and right-wing politicians is what is the role of the government in the economy. So, the left always say, let's expand the government spending, let's create free education, let's create free healthcare, let's create free everything. They need to offer more public goods, more infrastructure to make the life of the country easier in this way by being able to create what we call a redistribution of wealth. So, Somebody makes a lot of money, they will pay a lot of taxes, and this person will be able to contribute more in building schools that the poor can also use, in building public transportation that this person is not going to use that much, but the poor will be using, creating better health care so most people will have access to better health services, and all this. So this is what the left advocates. The right, on the other hand, advocates do not burden people with taxes because this makes the economic activity to go down. So the first thing that a Republican president does when they start in the United States or the right-hand side government take power in any country of the Western world, what they are doing is that they start with a law that decreases taxation. When a left side party, a left wing party wins the election, you have the opposite. You have government spending to actually increase and therefore they have to also increase taxation. So most of the times, these two things, they are not seen as alternative. 
they actually show what is the main difference that happens right now in the political scene for the last, let's say, 120 years between the left and the right. And this is exactly the reason why I presented all these slides with the technicalities so you will be able to understand what is an increase in G, what is an increase in T, how the two things can work together, how one thing is alternative of each other, but in reality, this is to show you, after all, that this is not just math, it's not just curves, it affects the life of the planet a lot. Now we're going in a circle of political election in the United States in November 2020. The Americans will be called to decide who will take the will of the country. They will leave it to the Republicans that they have shown clearly that they want less government, meaning less involvement of the government to everything else, which means government to spend less money. And since they will be able to spend less money, they will be able to also lower taxation and allow the households to spend more money stimulating the economy this way. Or they will elect some of the Democratic nominees that they want exactly the opposite. They want to tax more, especially the rich, to collect money from them and then put it into the use for everybody to be able to use it. These are two different political views. Now, as I showed you, you can achieve increase in income with one way or with another way, or even you can apply them both at the same time. So for example, increase G and decrease T, or decrease G and also decrease T, and these, both of them, they will be able to show you that you will have a higher income. But which one every person considers to be better is their own political view. Boils down not to theory of economics, it boils down to what is your political views. Now, as I said numerous times in this course, the purpose that we have here is not to teach you what is right and what is wrong. Our purpose and why we are here is to give you the necessary tools so you, on your own, you will be able to justify your own political views. If you have a right political view, you can keep having your right political view, but be able to understand what this means. So when you join a discussion, you know what the discussion is actually about. If you are a leftist, you can continue to be a leftist, but you should be a leftist understanding what this view actually advocates at an economic level, because the distinction after all is a per se economic distinction. So I'm not telling you to change your political views, I'm telling you that you should be able to justify them with arguments that they conform to the science. This is very important. You should not be a Republican because your dad was a Republican, and you should not be a Democrat because it's fashionable to be a Democrat. You should be what you have to be because you have some particular beliefs, and what this political view results it should conform to your belief. So you should be able to justify your opinions all the time. Now, the fiscal policy, of course, as you already understood from this discussion, is not free. It's actually very, very costly. That's why governments, at least serious governments, are very frugal of how they apply it. And we will see in the next lecture what happens if you get trigger happy with a fiscal policy and then you start, you keep doing it again and again and again because, oh, it works and oh, people like it and oh, I win election by doing it. All right, so we will see real cases of countries that they did that and then they were devastated for years. Okay, so... Let's see what is the cost of fiscal policy. Expansionary fiscal policy requires either governments to increase G or to decrease revenues. 
Increasing G or decreasing T may lead to budget deficits, meaning that you will do the government spending or you will decrease the taxation. How are you going to find the money to either increase G or if you decrease T, how are you going to find the money for the essential operations of the government? Who is going to fund that? So in our previous example, when G was 220 and T was 0.2, this was the first example that we had, income was 1,100 and the deficit was zero. Do the calculations, G minus T. So the, the government ran a zero deficit in this case because what they got from taxation was what they spent through G. When, however, they increased government spending with 45 units and kept the taxation coefficient constant, in this case, Y became 1,213, as we saw, but there was a deficit caused, and this was 22.5 units. So this caused a deficit to the central government there, to the federal government, of 22.5 units. In the other case, where they kept G constant, but they decreased the taxation, again, now they decreased the revenue part of the government, they kept their spending constant, and they decreased the revenue part of the government, and this led to the same income, but to an even higher deficit. Now, depending on the model, these two numbers here will not always be like that. So sometimes you might have the government spending to be more costly than uh, the decrease in taxation, okay? However, the message here, again, there is no model that will show you that increasing G is always better than decreasing T or the reverse, okay? There are situations that one is better and one uh, is, is worse and, and vice versa. But in general, in principle, what we want to show you here is that both of these, they have some cost. Here, you run at a zero deficit, and then here you, you have a, a, a deficit every year that will hurt the economy because this is money that will be borrowed from somebody and they have to be returned. And most of the times they have to be returned with a competitive interest rate as well. All right, so assume that the government wants to conduct expansionary fiscal policy without creating a deficit. So let's say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do expansionary fiscal policy without creating a deficit. How is that possible? Here's what I can do. I can increase G and I will fund my increased spending with an increase in T, in taxation. So I'll tax people and I will increase, uh, I will increase G. If you do that, you will stimulate the economy with the increase in G, but then you will make the economy contract because you also increase T. So it's like with the left hand you do expansionary fiscal policy through G, and with the right hand you do contractionary fiscal policy with T. So one will actually undo the result of the other. Okay, the increase in T will have a contractionary effect on Y. So one policy cancels the other, and the same would be true if you were doing the reverse, if you will decrease G, okay, and will also decrease T. I will do what Republicans say, I will decrease T, and I will also decrease G. All right, so if you do this, again, you will stimulate the economy by decreasing T, but you will make it contract if you also decrease G. So one policy again cancels the other. For this reason, most governments, they will apply expansionary fiscal policy by running deficits when they have to do it. So it's a usual phenomenon that if you apply fiscal policy, expansionary fiscal policy, in the same year, you will see that the government deficit will increase or if you are a country like Germany that you run huge surpluses and you never go into a deficit side, then in this case, the surplus will decrease 
you are not going to make it to a deficit, but your surplus will decrease. All right, so deficits, if they are created, they are funded by issuing government securities, government bonds. So government needs money. They will print bonds. We saw how this works through the central bank and everything. And at some point, these bonds, they have to be paid back with interest also. So if they keep piling up all the deficits together, they will create a huge debt. And today we have several countries that they are in a debt crisis. And the most characteristic example of that is Greece. Greece's crisis is a crisis that is because of the government debt. So the government debt was so big that it was unsustainable. And because of that, this actually created a snowball of effects in the whole economy that we will examine in the next lecture in detail. This is with respect to the commodity market. Last time we examined the money market. Today we finished with the commodity market and it becomes clear, and we also know that from the reality around us, that markets should be interconnected. They are not independent for each other. So we cannot anyhow believe that what happens with the commodity market will not affect the money market or vice versa. So we have to be able to identify some variables of one market that once they change, they affect a variable in the other market. In other words, are there any kind of theoretical, at least to begin with, connections between the markets? Are there any links between the market that our theory, our models can help us identify? Output is transacted using money. All right, so we know that from since we are like four years old that we cannot buy candy unless our parents first gives us some money. All right. So output is transacted using money. However, output is a variable, the equilibrium of which is determined in the commodity market. We just saw how we calculate Y star. On the other hand, the interest rate, which is the price of money, is determined in the money market. Since output is transacted with money, there you have a connection that one variable is connected to another, but one is a money variable and the other is a commodity variable. So you have these two different variables that they affect each other, but they are from different markets. Now the two markets are connected with each other through two links that they are based on the very important results that we derived in the previous lecture, lecture nine, and a little bit ago in lecture 10. The first is a link that takes us from the commodity market to the money market. Be careful here, there is directionality. This means that link one starts from the commodity market and goes to the money market, doesn't come back. It's a one-way train towards that direction. This link is that if you have higher Y star, then you will observe an increase in money demand. This was what we said in the previous time, L1. This thing here is because of L1. Now, if you have an increased money demand, what you will observe is that if money supply remains constant, you will have an interest rate, or at least a higher money demand will cause a pressure to the interest rate, so it will go up. All right, so link number one starts from a commodity market variable, ends to a money market variable, which is the interest rate, the price of money. Okay, and says that if you increase Y star, if you increase the equilibrium in one, the equilibrium in the other will also tend to increase. That's link one. There is also link two. Link two takes us from the money market to the commodity market. Again, there is directionality now. 
It's a one-way train from the money market to the commodity market. Now, according to Link2, if you have a higher interest rate, this will decrease the investment. This is what we called before L2, earlier in today's lecture. So higher interest rate will discourage investment. People will prefer to keep their money in the bank rather than investing it. So therefore, higher R star decreases investment. And because investment is what the firms have in order to produce output for the next period, if you decrease investment, you will see a decrease in Y star. So link number two is a link that starts from a money market variable and ends with the commodity market variable and actually tells us that the higher interest rate will eventually cause a decrease in Y star. So again, we have two links, one link from the commodity market to the money market that higher Y star causes an increase in R star and then in link two, from the money market to the commodity market, that higher interest rate will cause a decrease in Y star. Those links will automatically be activated. Once I have a higher Y star, I should expect that this will be transmitted to the money market and increase the interest rate or create pressure for the interest rate to increase. Or if I have a higher interest rate in the money market, automatically I should see discouragement of investment and eventually Y star will go down. Let's examine now these two links in a little more detail. The commodity market determines the equilibrium interest rate Y star. However, the higher the output, the more money firms and households will demand to transact it. A change in Y star will cause a change in MD towards the same direction. Therefore, a change in Y star will cause a change of the equilibrium interest rate unless the central bank decides to prevent it by adjusting the money supply. Link 1, therefore, establishes a channel of shock transmission from the commodity market towards the money market. So again, this is a one-way train that goes from the one market to the other, transferring possible shocks, possible things that might happen in one market, and then this will be transmitted, become contagious to other different markets, one of which could be the money market. Now, if you have link one, link one can be activated also with fiscal policy. Let's put our two markets side by side. Here is my commodity market, which equilibrates at Y zero star. And here is my money market with my money demand and my money supply, which is set by the Federal Reserve Bank or the Central Bank in order to yield an equilibrium interest rate R zero star. So my two markets equilibrate at Y zero star and R zero star, and everything is nice and calm, and this situation will not be interrupted unless something happens. One of these things that can happen is, for example, the government will decide to have fiscal policy, that is, they will decide to increase G, shifting the purple curve, C plus I plus G, upwards, and this will create the economy to equilibrate at point C, where it yields a equilibrium income, which is now Y star 1. If, however, this happens, link one will be activated because now we have a shock happening in the commodity market and this shock has to be transmitted to the other market. Okay, so the increase in output will cause the money demand to shift to a, an increased position towards the northwest and this will create a pressure for the interest rate to rise to R1 star unless the central bank who has committed to keep the interest rate at R0 star decides to honor its commitment and increase the money supply in order to maintain the price of money to the same 
level as if it was before the shock. This particular action by the central bank is called accommodation of fiscal policy. Accommodation of fiscal policy is when the government changes something in the commodity market, namely they apply fiscal policy, and then in the other market, in the money market, the central bank actually is able to figure out how this shock is going to affect the money market and adjust the money supply so it will not allow the interest rate from changing. Now, what is important for you to understand here is that if this central bank did not adjust the money supply so that the interest rate will remain at our zero star, if they were sleeping and they were not doing that, or if they didn't want to accommodate the policy, then what would happen was that R will move up to our one star and this would activate link two. So now the shock will make it here, affect the interest rate, and then bounce back to the other market. And link two says that if I see the interest rate to go up, this will decrease investment. So this curve here would rebound all again down and this would create a decrease now to the income in this particular economy. So if the central bank does not accommodate the fiscal policy by increasing the money supply, maintaining the interest rate constant, the effect of the fiscal policy will not be Y1 star, it will be way less than Y1 star because we will have a vicious cycle of link one activating and breaking the shock here and then link two activating and breaking the shock back here and then again this would bounce back and forth and that's why in the picture that I have in the links between the markets I have this pendulum toy which is called the Newton's cradle and this is something that shows how one shock goes from the one market to the other and the markets will play this kind of ping pong in the same way that the pendulum takes one shock from the far left ball and brings it to the right ball and then this will keep going till it dies down in the end. Now let's see an example of link two here. In the money market, the central bank determines the real interest rate by adjusting the money supply so this interest rate will become the equilibrium interest rate. So the real interest rate negatively affects the investment. The variables between the two markets that they are connected, according to Link2, is the interest rate from the money market and investment from the commodity market. Uh, this happens because lower interest rate will make the investment projects to seem more attractive since the opportunity cost of investing now goes down as the bank will give you less interest rate. Some investment will appear to be viable now, while before with a higher interest rate they were not. Investment is one of the most crucial determinants of output expenditure. So it's a part of C plus I plus G, which yields the output. And this means that my output will be affected if the real interest rate affects investment. So a decrease in the interest rate will increase investment, which will increase C plus I plus G, the total expenditure, which will in turn increase Y star. This is link two. So a shock that happens in the money market will use link two in order to be transmitted, carried to the commodity market. All right, let's see this in action. Let's see something happening in the money market, which is called quantitative easing, and it's in the news very often lately. So here is my two markets. Again, they equilibrate at Y zero star and R zero star at points A and B respectively. And now central bank decides to increase the money supply in order to lower the interest rate. This is when in the beginning of a term, 
the head of a central bank comes out and announces that from now on, the new interest rate that we will try to implement will be R1 star, which is lower by some units of R0 star that was before. All right, so central bank increases money supply in order to achieve a lower equilibrium interest rate. Investment increases to I1 because of that reason, since link two now is activated and we will have a transmission of this shock, the shock being the change of the interest rate. This will be transmitted to the commodity market. So investment increases to I1. This will push the purple curve to climb to a parallel position higher than it was before because of the change in investment. And the commodity market will equilibrate at point D, which yields an equilibrium output equal to Y1 star. However, this is not the end of the story because now I have a shock that happens in the commodity market, the shock being that I had an increase in output so this will activate link one. Link one says that my, when my output increases, this should cause an increase in the interest rate. All right. Unless this is blocked somehow. How can it be blocked? Well, it cannot be blocked in the commodity market. The reason that it cannot, a shock cannot be blocked in the commodity market easily is because the commodity market is a very slow moving market that several parties are involved and they do not usually coordinate in a way of stabilizing the economy. So the commodity market by construction and by definition is not possible to have a stabilization role here, a stabilizing role. So there's no way to block the shock that the decrease of the interest rate caused to this market. So the shock will inevitably bounce back to this market. So this will cause the money demand to increase because now people have more income and they will need to hold more money. And there will be pressure for the money market to equilibrate at E and the interest rate to go to R2. But the central bank didn't want R2, they wanted R1. And in addition, this is a very fast moving market and the central bank can actually neutralize this new shock that bounced back from the commodity market in the same way that they did before. So they can keep increasing the money supply till they achieve the interest rate to go and equilibrate at the position that will be what they promised initially, R1 star. So they will keep increasing money supply adjusting money supply so that money market will equilibrate on R1 star and nowhere else. All right, so again, re let's review what happened. Economy was equilibrating at A and at B. Money market was at B. Then the bank, the central bank, decided to take the money market to point C by increasing money supply in order to decrease the interest rate and this caused the commodity market to move from A to D, in other words to have a higher income. Now higher income causes a pressure to the interest rate to increase so it will make, it wants to make the money market to go to point E. This however will not be allowed by a well-functioning central bank which will keep increasing the money supply till the point that the money market will equilibrate at F and you will have an interest rate R1 star as initially this particular bank promised to the economy. What we have here is that the central bank operates into two different stages here. The first stage from moving the money supply from MS to MS prime 
is because they want to decrease the interest rate. The further increase to the money supply to MS double prime is because they want to keep, to maintain the equilibrium interest rate at R1 star. Now, a sensible and well-functioning central bank will not be taken into surprise when after they move the money market from B to C, the money market will tend to go to E. So what they will do from the very beginning is that they will gradually start increasing money supply and they will anticipate from the very beginning that the, the total money supply, the total increase in money supply will stop at this point where the money market will equilibrate at F. In other words, from the very beginning, a well-functioning central bank will be able to predict that once they lower the interest rate, this will not happen with MS prime, but it will happen at the MS double prime, and they will know this from the beginning. In this graph, we just decompose the overall monetary policy to two parts. The first part is for achieving an equilibrium interest rate that is lower, and the second part is for stabilizing the economy to that particular interest rate and relieve the pressure of interest rate to increase. Next, I want to discuss what happens with the monetary policy. Monetary policy can reach the commodity market. So what happens in the money market will actually affect one of the most important parts of the economy, which is the commodity market, total production and therefore growth of output, at least short-term growth of output. So via link to the central bank can use the interest rate as a tool that will affect the equilibrium output in the commodity market. So expansionary monetary policy, in other words, increasing money supply to decrease the interest rate, is expected to affect the equilibrium output positively because of the increase in investment. So the increase in investment is the intermediator of this result here. On the contrary, contractionary monetary policy is the opposite decreasing the money supply to decrease the interest rate, which is expected to affect Y star negatively because, again, investment will decrease. However, the cost of the expansionary policy through money, the expansionary monetary policy, is that it will increase inflation. Don't forget that when you want to lower the interest rate, you will achieve that by increasing the money supply. If you print more money, you should expect to see inflation unless the output grows at the same rate or higher rate. So the decrease in R is achieved through an increase in money supply and ceteris paribus, this is expected to have an effect on inflation. This means that you can use contractionary monetary policy to ease inflation. It will be extremely easy for any country in the world to lower inflation or to make inflation to be zero or to even make inflation to be negative. This is something that you can very easily do it. Even a first year economic student knows how to do that by decreasing the money supply. The problem is if you start increasing the money supply, this will have some negative effects to the output via link two output is going to decrease in this case. Nobody wants to cause that, so it's not simple to just decrease inflation. So we are going to use contractionary monetary policy only in cases where the economy is overheated. It works nearly full capacity, and in case this works, there's no purpose of keep, increase, keep stimulating it, keep increasing the, the money supply, and in this case, you want to decrease the money supply to ease inflation a little bit. Now, one of the most important roles of the central bank is to be able to stabilize the macroeconomy, and this is because we see that the money market is much more fast acting than any other market in the economy, commodity market included, and therefore it's very suitable 
in order to use it as a ground to absorb, stabilize, neutralize, or contain different shocks that they are coming from other markets. So in the everyday economic reality, different shocks hit the markets, like all the time. Like the money market can be hit by a sudden change in the money demand. Like for example, speculators all over the world, they change their money demand habits instantaneously and continuously. All right, we have a monetary policy that happens by central bank, a lot of money shocks that can happen within the money market that they need to uh, uh, be stabilized there or else they will affect other markets. On the commodity market, which is the only other market that we know so far, you might have changes in consumption habits, like for example, a shock happens in the economy, a virus appears, and suddenly we all realize that we have to go and buy more than usual for our uh, necessities. As known, the, the biggest necessity that the first world households have is toilet paper, and therefore, uh, in every crisis from now on, we should stock and hoard as much toilet paper as possible in order to be safe in case something bad happens. So changes in consumption habits, changes in investment opportunities, changes in government spending, changes in taxation, in imports, exports, everywhere you can have a shock that will affect the commodity market coming from everywhere. So every time a shock hits one market, automatically creates the possibility of transmission of this shock from the one market to another. In other words, link one and link two will be activated and they will start a vicious cycle, a chain reaction, according to which link one will be activated, then will cause a shock in the money market. This shock will activate link two, which will cause another shock in the commodity market, will activate link one again, and then link two again and link one again, and the two markets will start playing this kind of ping pong between them. Eventually, however, this shock will die down, meaning that every time that the shock is transmitted from the one market to another and it comes back to the initial market, you will see that the shock is actually smaller. So if you have this going back and forth several times, at some point the shock will die down, but still the economy will be going like that for this amount of time till the shock dies down. So we don't want this to happen. Stabilization will be very, very important. So we should have the central bar bank to try to neutralize the shock before it is retransmitted. In other words, shocks will be stabilized, neutralized, contained into the money market by the central bank. One of the most important functions of the central bank is to monitor the economy for shocks. And once a shock happens, the central bank should try to neutralize it there, stabilize it there before it hits other markets. In case of such a shock, the central bank will make the necessary adjustments to the money supply so that the shock will not affect the interest rate. If the shock does not affect the interest rate, link two will never be activated and then the shock will die within the money market without causing a problem to any other market from then and on. So effectively, this will neutralize the shock will contain it into the money market and will prevent it from reaching the commodity market or other markets. In that sense, the central bank acts as a suspension in the economy, suspension of the economic vehicle, in the same way that the car has suspensions and springs, and when it goes over an anomaly on the street, the suspension will absorb the shock so the driver and the passengers will not really realize how bad the shock was. So the suspension is the one that tries to neutralize the shocks. All right, so absorbs the shocks of the economic path. The final topic that we will talk about today is unemployment. Our discussion today about unemployment will be the introduction of next lectures discussion 
about the labor market. So let's start understanding what unemployment is, why is it bad, and what is the unemployment levels in Singapore and in the rest of the world. So unemployment is always a hot issue in politics. Let's see why it's one of the hottest issue all the time. Long-term unemployment causes three serious traumas to the people that they are unemployed. The first serious trauma is loss of income. Okay, that's uh, for some families losing their job. One of the two members might be crucial for them in being able to maintain the survival level of income that they require. The second trauma is loss of skills. If you stay unemployed for a long amount of time, a long period, this will cause some of your skill to be deteriorate and for you also to not being able to catch up to the new technologies and the new practices in the interest industry that you are qualified to work. So loss of skills is something that will take you time to catch up. That's why we see that a lot of firms, when they are looking to hire workers, not for the entry level positions, but for more specialized positions, they will always prefer to take workers that they are not unemployed for a long time before, because this means they need a longer time to catch up. And the third uh, trauma, the most important one, is the loss of, per of perceived self-worth. In other words, unemployment creates also a severe psychological trauma that might be more intense and more important than the other two. And before you think about like, oh, this will be a result only for sensitive people, will not affect me, it's not what... I'm afraid of, like, if, even if I stay unemployed, I will be psychologically okay. That's easy to say till it happens to you because I was exactly like that. And then uh, in 2009, I had to do my army service after I came back from the United States. So I went to the Greek army and I had to finish in the next year. And when I finished the next year, I had already arranged that I would be hired by a Greek university and I will be continuing my career in, uh, in my country, in Greece. And this was a very nice plan till uh, the crisis of 2009 hit, the, hit Greece and uh, Greece was hit later than the other countries uh, from the crisis. So this job did not materialize. When I finished my army service and I went to this university to start working there, they told me, sorry, your hiring could not go through because the Ministry of Education did not approve any hires for us, for you that we wanted to hire and several other people that we wanted to hire at the same time also. So I stayed without a job and this happened around September of 2010. And in September, it's already late to find a job as a researcher or an educator in another university because universities have made their hires from uh, before August. So the people will start working there in the beginning of September. So I, it was very late for me to go to the market. Now, not for a single moment, I thought that I will not be able to find a job next year somewhere else. Actually, I did go to the market next year when the market opened again. Academics market in economics opens once a year. So I did go to the market and I had several positions to be able to select which one I wanted. And I chose the one that was closer to my initial decision to go to Cyprus, which is also another country that is very close in my country. And, and also they speak Greek. It's, it's, a, it's a country that was uh, the next best back in time for me. Okay, so I had uh, for, for not a single moment the, uh, the fear of not being able to find a job next year. However, this year that I stayed without a job, I tried my best to focus on my research, to write some papers as I actually did, to be able to organize your files and, and prepare material for the classes that you will be called to be teaching for next year and every other things that an educator can do when they, they have uh, no job at this specific time. So I did all that. 
But I can tell you that this year was one of the worst years in my life because I felt that at this particular point, I was completely useless in the society. I knew that I would be getting a job, but I would get off bed 10 o'clock in the morning because, you know, I would go to bed the previous, the previous night very late from working or from doing uh, many other different things. I had nothing to do. I could wake up anytime I wanted and I wake up at 10 o'clock and then I would feel guilty that, you know, I'm like a lazy bum that I'm getting off bed at 10 o'clock. Why am I doing that? So it makes you lose a feeling that you have that you are doing something and you are useful in society. And I didn't believe that this will happen also to me because every time I was strong and every time that I saw somebody who was sensitive, I was like, oh, they are sensitive. I'm not like that. But in reality, this can affect everybody. Okay, so I did have a loss of income. I did have a loss of skills because when I went back to the academia, I haven't taught for two years, including my army service year and the year that I stayed without a job. And then I got a job as a researcher at the University of Cyprus. And I had to go to teach after three years. And the first couple of months that I was teaching, I was still trying to catch up because I lost my touch with, with teaching and how uh, I would present the material to students or in some uh, research that I was doing, I, I also lost some of the previous developments and I had to sit down and catch up. And as I told you, the psychological shock was very intense as well. Now, because of this enormous economic and social cost, policymakers try to limit unemployment in the economy. So unemployment is in the center of almost every discussion of politics. And you will see that even in countries that they have very, very low unemployment, you will see that there is a discussion for unemployment. Uh, right now, the political debate in the US in 2020 is about unemployment a very large extent. So you will see in every presidential debate, they will discuss for a long time about unemployment, even though the unemployment that they have now is very, very low. Uh, I saw advertisements in Singapore's TV for unemployment, how they call it entrenchment situations that they are here. And in Singapore, we have one of the unemployment rates that would be a dream for other countries. The unemployment rate is super slow, at least before the COVID-19 crisis. Unemployment rate was super, super low in, in Singapore, and still this is a concern in society. So this is not an easy task to be able to do something about unemployment. Uh, just measuring unemployment is challenging. Let's uh, uh, consider an example. Uh, a jobless 30-year-old person who is actively looking for work should count as uh, unemployed. But what if he's not looking for a job? Like, take my case, for example. In 2010, when I was not looking for a job because the market was not open yet, and I didn't have a need to go work as a, uh, a waiter or something else for this year, so I stayed at home, I was doing my things. Was unemployed or not? According to the definition of unemployment, I was not unemployed. But see, even defining it, I was unemployed. I was looking for a job. I was not looking for any job. Okay, so even the definition of this is, is kind of complicated. So according to the official definition, a person of 16 years of age or older is unemployed when? First, is not working. You will be here. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much that if you are not working, you are unemployed. No, this is important because sometimes you have several people that they are having a job, they work somewhere, they are vastly overqualified for what they are doing, and they are doing it only till they find the job that they want. So if, some, for example, you have somebody who works as, a, as an Uber driver until they're able to get a job in academia because they have a PhD in something, this person is vastly overqualified for what they are doing, is underutilized 
according to the services that this person can offer to the economy, is underutilized, but is not going to count as unemployed because it's already employed somewhere. Second, is available for work at the prevailing wage rate. This is important. For example, I know a lot of people in my country that they are unemployed for a long time and they will not get a job even though they had a few offers for a job because they are under the idea that they are worth much more than what the people are actually giving them. Okay, so this means that either they overestimate their abilities and they don't agree with the market of what they can offer, or they are in a very bad state and they cannot find what they, they, they really deserve. In any case, you should be available for work at the prevailing wage rate in order to be considered unemployed. If, for example, you go to the unemployment office and you file for unemployment benefits and they find you a job according to qualifications that does not pay as much as you want and you reject this job just because they don't pay as much as you think, but they think that this is how the market rate for what you offer goes right now, they will disqualify you for unemployment benefits. So they will not consider you unemployed anymore. They will say this person doesn't want to work. And number three, this person has made specific efforts to find work in the past four weeks. In some countries, this matters. In some other countries, it doesn't matter a lot. Like, for example, in the United States, you have to show proof that you are looking for a job. In Greece, if you are unemployed, uh, the unemployment office will make you offers of getting some jobs that they actually uh, subsidize through the government somehow. Very rarely they make these offers to people because there is very high unemployment in Greece right now. So they will make you these offers and only if you reject these offers they will figure out that you are not looking for a job but they do not have the uh, knowledge of if you are looking or not. In the United States, you will see that if you file for unemployment benefits, you have to show proof that you went for interviews, that you sent CVs and, and stuff like that. Sometimes they will even call companies and say, okay, did uh, Mr. Marinakis Cosmas came there and, uh, and applied for any position? Did you interview him? Uh, was he willing to get the job and all this? So you have to making specific efforts to find work in the last uh, uh, in the past four weeks or not, or otherwise you are not going to be eligible to be considered unemployed. Now, a person who is working counts as employed, even if the job is temporary or the worker is overqualified or underutilized in the current position. So if you have a nuclear physicist who works as a cleaner, all right, she is vastly underutilized. So as a, as a production factor, it's vastly underutilized. So a, a, a large part of this production factor is not utilized. It's as if you have a photocopier that can print 100,000 copies a day and you just have it to print a copy uh, a month when you need to make a, a photocopy. Okay, or if you uh, have a Ferrari and you just drive it inside your, your parking lot or something like that. So even if the production factor is underutilized, it doesn't count the underutilization. It binary gives a value of zero or one. Yes, you are employed or no, you are not uh, employed according to if you have a job or not. That's the only thing that the definition of unemployment examines. A person who is neither working, not looking for a job, is not in the labor force. So population will be equal to the people that they are in the labor force and those who are not in the labor force. Labor force will be equal to the number of employed plus the number of unemployed. And therefore, the unemployment rate can be calculated as the number of unemployed over the labor force. Be careful here. These are easy to understand formulas, but a very usual mistake that I see very often is that a lot of people are under the impression that the unemployment rate is the number of unemployed over the population. This is not true. If 5% of the population is unemployed, this doesn't mean that the 
unemployment rate is 5% in this particular economy unless everybody is in the labor force. Okay, so try to work out these formulas and to be able to understand them. They are, they are super easy. Just make sure that you, uh, uh, you clear them up in your mind. There are some objective difficulties in measuring unemployment. Even though the unemployment rate provides a very viable and useful estimation for how we utilize the factor of labor in the production, it has some drawbacks, all right? Two important biases are included here. The first bias is a significant number of individuals drop out of the labor force and they do not actively search for a job because they are discouraged. This is a result that, was attribu that is attributed to Dr. Uh, Gary Becker from the University of Chicago. He got a Nobel Prize for this. And this connects to the psychological effect of unemployment that we discussed in the very beginning. This means that a lot of workers, they are looking for a job, they go into several interviews, they, they try to get a job, they are completely and uh, continuously getting rejected. They understand that they have no hope in finding a job and then uh, they get into the margin and they start falling off the, uh, the labor force. So they are uh, not actively looking for a job anymore. And the thing is that even though they would really want to have a job, at the prevailing interest rate, and they satisfy all the criteria of the definition, because of reasons that they find it totally pointless, they will not keep looking for a job because they say, I have no hope in how the economy is today to ever being able to find a job. So this is the discouraged worker effect, and it's a bias. You have people that in uh, principle, they are unemployed, but they are not counted as unemployed. So this is uh, something that makes the, an effect that makes the unemployment rate to appear lower than what it actually is. The second important bias is when some individuals which are normally employed, they pose as unemployed. So they pretend that they are unemployed. So they go to the boss and they say, okay, fire me, and now I will be working the same as I worked before, but under the table, or the boss says that. This happens because they want to avoid taxes or avoid uh, paying social security contribution or uh, fraudulently collect unemployment benefits. So they pose as unemployed, even though in principle they do have a job. So this makes the percentage of unemployment to appear higher than it actually is because these people pose as unemployed, but in reality, they are employed. So these are falsely unemployed individuals, but they are counted as employed. Still, however, the measurement of unemployment suffers from these two biases, but in any way, it's the best estimation that we have for the utilization of the labor factor in the economy, and it provides some very useful insights about that. Now, let's see some trends in the unemployment rate across the world. The unemployment rate tends to be highly correlated with the short-run GDP growth. When the GDP falls, the unemployment rate tends to rise. This is something that you should expect reasonably, that when you have uh, a recession in the economy, the economy is going down, you should see unemployment to rise. When you have an expansion in the economy, you should see that unemployment should be going down. This makes completely sense. So during a typical US recession, the unemployment rate reaches a level between 6 and 9%. So this is a typical recession as we... Uh, observe it in the United States that unemployment will be between 6 and 9%. During an expansion of the economy, the opposite of a recession, the unemployment will fluctuate between 3.5% and 5%. Uh, in the later years, we have seen some unemployment rates that they are lower than 3.5%. 
a little lower than 3.5%. Uh, uh, Donald Trump says that this is because of his policies. However, we saw a clear tendency for unemployment to, to decrease persistently even before he takes office. Uh, his policies undoubtedly has, have helped unemployment at least in some uh, key sectors that they suffered for unemployment before. However, these numbers that I'm showing you here is a little bit subjective. They are true only for the United States. Different economies might behave slightly different or very different than in the United States. In any case, you should not expect to see an unemployment rate that is close to zero or zero. The reason that you will not see that is because there are frictions in the labor market. In other words, the time that you spend between jobs cannot be exactly zero. You, you will not be fired from one position on Friday at five o'clock and then on Monday at eight o'clock you will be able to find the job unless you have organized and orchestrated this from before. Okay, but if you lose your job unexpectedly on Friday at five o'clock, you are not going to expect to get a job immediately afterwards. Okay, so this time that is between jobs, this is something that you will be counted as unemployed. So since we cannot make this down to zero, you should expect to see some unemployment at least because of that. We will talk about frictional unemployment next time. Now I want to show you the unemployment cycles in the US. You will see what I told you before, that unemployment actually has its ups and its downs. I'm starting here from 1969 and I go up to a year before and you see that, uh, that unemployment goes up and down. These are data that they are even quarterly data. So you have all these uh, fluctuation in the index of unemployment throughout the year. But you can understand if you uh, put the average there, the average is 6.25%, I think, then this average unemployment is not very uh, very consistent throughout time. Sometimes unemployment is much lower, some other times it goes up and moves around in a manner that uh, seems that is quite cyclical. Okay, this cycle of unemployment, of course, follows the short-term fluctuations of the income. As we see income increasing, then unemployment should decrease. And if income decreases, unemployment should increase. Now, this is what we see in the United States. I want to show you some unemployment levels around the world so you will have some context of what is going on. And we will start a very useful discussion here. Uh, so let me start from 1990, and I will show you the unemployment through time in several countries. Let's start with Singapore, of course. So Singapore's un unemployment has peaked uh, in uh, 2003 to something like 6%, and then it uh, uh, steadily decreased with a brief exception of the crisis of, uh, of 2007, and still, even today, it's in a very low levels. Uh, uh, before the crisis of, of COVID-19, that is not really a typical thing that we have ever observed in the last century. So, so we, we, have, we are pretty uncertain how this will go. But uh, if you have no severe shocks in the economy, till the point that the severe shocks start, start happening, you see that, that unemployment rate in Singapore, which again, one more time, it's a very manageable economy, you see that is kept very, very low. Uh, let's put again the United States unemployment now here just to compare a little bit. I want you to compare how Singapore was affected from the crisis of 2007 and how the US was affected. Okay, unemployment is a very good index to show you how these two economies were affected in a very different degree from the crisis of 2007. Uh, let's see now... Germany, which is one of the most robust economies in Europe. We see that uh, Germany had a high unemployment rate till uh, 2005. And then even within the crisis, we saw that the unemployment rate in, uh, in, in Germany has a, a very negative trend, uh, negative for unemployment, good for the people. So we see that the unemployment rate there is persistently decreasing from 2005 and later, with a very, very brief exception 
through uh, the crisis that you had a very small jump in unemployment, interrupted this decreased trend, but then it very quickly caught up and continued. Here is France. France has a very different picture, has uh, a consistently high unemployment rate, like even today that all the other three countries have already decreased their unemployments below 5%, we see that France kind of maintains a high unemployment. And this is a basic reason for the political turbulence and all these uh, shocks that the political life in France goes through because there is a, a number of people that they are unemployed. So you see an unemployment rate that stays around 9% throughout the, uh, the last uh, uh, three decades. And this is uh, something that you don't see the full picture here. If you see the unemployment rate in people above 40 in France, you will see that it's particularly low, while this big unemployment comes from the unemployment of the younger people. What you see here on this graph, this 9% average, is the average of a small unemployment for older people and a larger unemployment for younger people. And this is something that for the future is not very promising because when the old people will go out of the labor force and the young people will become the older people and then you will have new young people, what is going to happen then? Are you going to get a job in your 40s when till your 40s you were unemployed or this economy will turn just to new uh, employees and, and you will have this continuing, will have a lost generation in economies that they look like that. This is a, a very important social problem. If you have any thoughts about it, please write down in the comments. Just involve yourselves into the discussion. These are very interesting topics, interesting topics that you should be concerned about. Uh, here is uh, China. China has a consistently low unemployment because a country that we see that it grows unstoppably for the last 30 years. You will see Malaysia that is in a similar situation like, like China. And you will also see India that has a, a similar unemployment rate to those uh, two countries. And then I want to keep only France and the United States in this example. Uh, I, I keep the United States because of the effect of the crisis. And I keep the France, because of its high unemployment rate, consistently high. And I want to bring some other countries now that they have very different patterns of unemployed. So I want to change the vertical axis. I want to be able to accommodate bigger unemployment rates here. So let's make this axis to be up to 28% now. So this will appear as if it is smaller. Let's add Italy. So Italy kind of follows France, but then after the crisis, it looks like that Italy has a, a more upward trend of unemployment than, than France. And then look at Ireland and the effect of, of the crisis on Ireland's unemployment. So we see that Ireland's unemployment explodes during the crisis and then keeps increasing even after the crisis and it catches up with what it was before several years later. So we'll see that the 2007-2009 world financial crisis affected Ireland till the end of, of 2016 because we see that it caught up to its initial trend several years later after the crisis had already finished. Let's see this example of Spain. Spain is a, a very exceptional example. Look the effect of the crisis in Spain. In the peak of unemployment in Spain, unemployment was 26%. And this is very difficult to top unless you are Greece. And Greece started with an unemployment rate that was below 12%. And look what happened after the crisis. First of all, Greece was late into seeing the effects of the crisis. The real crisis started in Greece in 2009 and continues even till today. And you will see that the unemployment rate actually rapidly increased, even surpassed the one that was in Spain, the record unemployment of Spain, and is 
still very, very high and is decreased with very low pace. So this is the context that you can have for the unemployment rate. Next week, we'll be talking about the unemployment in the context of the labor market, and we will discuss the causal reasons of unemployment and how it works. Write down in the comments anything you want. I will answer to everything. You can start the discussion. Also, if you want, try to answer other people's questions. Before you ask your questions, check the comment section because you might see that your question has been asked before. And I don't want to be rude and tell you that this, I have already answered it, just go below and read it from there. So check the comments. The comments sometimes, they, they make very useful information. I think that we will stop here for today and we will continue with the last lecture next week, lecture 11. Stay tuned. Thank you very much.